Amen. Welcome to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College Chapel on this Thursday second chapel of the fall semester. We're excited to be back in the house of the Lord. Hey, John says in Revelation 1-7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and all the earth will mourn because of him. Anybody thankful that Jesus is coming again? Yes. Amen. We get to worship him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords right here in his house today. Well, my friend, our president, Dr. Charles R. Goodman, is going to be preaching today. We're excited about uh, that. Uh, you know him well, and uh, he, I, I'm trying to avoid that, that famous line. Uh, you know him, great friend of the institution, all right? And uh, we're praying for him and, and looking forward to Dr. Goodman preaching the Word of God for us. So we're going to pray, and our worship team is going to come and the Lord's going to inhabit the praise of his people right here today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We worship you, Father. We stand in awe of you and how great and awesome that you are. We pray that, Father, you would strengthen us for this journey that we are on as the semester is before us. Help us to manage our time wisely. God, help us to apply ourselves not just academically but ministerially, Lord. I pray your anointing upon the man of God today that you would loose his tongue, position your gifting within him, and preach through him today that we could hear from heaven and it would move our hearts. We we pray these things today in the name above all names, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, Clear Creek family, it's great to be back with you. We had our alumni with us on Tuesday. Now this is our first, what do you say, quote unquote, normal chapel we're going to have together. So I'm glad to have all of you guys here. Let's stand together and worship our Savior. You saints of the Lord Is laid for your faith In his excellent word What more can he say Than to you he has said To you who for refuge To Jesus has fled Fear not he is with us So be not dismayed as Lord will press on enduring the darkest of storms and though even hell should endeavor to shake he'll never no never no never forsake Amen. 
and give the Lord praise, church. And now for those new students and uh, those that have not been here with us before, this is the first time this year we're going to get our chance to have our time of prayer. This is a time, I pray, that doesn't become just monotonous to us, a time that just isn't going through the motions, but a time we set aside as our Clear Creek family to pray to our Savior together every single chapel. So whether you feel led to sit, stand, or come to this altar, let us go and petition our Father who hears our words this morning. Let us pray. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone. And oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days. Oh, Lord, 
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth, you are the one we adore. You are the one that we praise this morning. And as this semester begins, I can think of no better way than declaring as a group that we are in your debt. And it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we can even stand in this room and sing a single word or preach a single word. And so now as we enter that time of worship through your word,
Come upon President Goodman boldly now. Let him preach what you would have him to preach this morning and help us leave here changed and not the same. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Nix. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Clear Creek. What a privilege and an honor it is to be gathered together in the chapel this day. Hard to believe that the semester has already started and it's already rolling, right? Uh, we're going to blink a few times and the semester will be over, but it is my honor and privilege to uh, bring God's Word to you today. If you have your Bibles, I want you to find the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Version today, Galatians chapter 6. We're going to look at the first five verses, and I want to preach this day on the subject, the responsibility of the redeemed, the responsibility of the redeemed. There's a a threefold responsibility. Maybe you could uh, delineate more out of the passage, but I see a threefold responsibility that the Apostle Paul presents to us as believers, to those who have been redeemed. If you're able to do so, I encourage you to stand with me out of the honor of the reading of God's Word. Now, Brother Mark's been here for uh, several days preaching. Some of you were a part of that. Uh, some of you probably don't need your, your pump prime, but I learned a long time ago that uh, Baptists often do. So can you say amen? Amen. You can say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can you say glory? Glory. Amen. That always makes me feel better. I trust it does you as well. As Dr. Smith reminded us, our Lord inhabits the praise of his people. Here's what the Bible says, Galatians chapter 6 and starting in verse number 1, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 1. Again, this is the New American Standard Version. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. Let us pray together. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together in this place. Father, I thank you for the privilege of preaching your word. And Lord, I ask you this day that you would just move during our time together. Father, I pray you'd give me clarity of mind and clarity of tongue that I might articulate your word in a way it's pleasing to you. Lord, in a way that's edifying to uh, this congregation. Lord, in a way that's, that's edifying to, to me, even as your preacher. And Father, as I stand here, I recognize that I cannot do this in myself, of myself, or by myself. So Father, I cry out for that which only you can give. I pray for anointing, Lord, the anointing that makes the preaching of your word easy and the anointing that allows me to preach with great boldness. And Father, I ask you that you give me unction to preach as a dying man to dying people. Lord, may this not just be a, a scheduled session. Lord, may this not just be a, a time where we gather and, Lord, we, we listen with a, a censorious ear, Lord. But I, I pray that this would be a day that we would gather, that we might desire to hear from you. Lord, that you would do a work in us as individuals, do a work in this place, and may you be glorified and magnified. It's in the name of Jesus that we ask all of these things. Amen. amen and amen. The responsibility of the redeemed. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul writing to the churches of Galatia, uh, we find that uh, this region it derives its name from the Gauls who came from France and brought that name with them. And then this region, which is now in modern Turkey, is called Galatia, the region of Galatia. It's interesting that this is the only letter the Apostle Paul writes that's to a group of churches that extends beyond one particular city. And we find that the theme of this great letter is the reality of the power of the gospel, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. Uh, it's been said that this is the Magna Carta of Christian freedom. Uh, we find that even Martin Luther, the great reformer, uh, he said that he was betrothed to this book. In essence, he says, I'm married to this book. And many scholars say that the Reformation was built upon Luther's commentary of this very book. 
But when we get to chapter 5 and chapter 6, we see that the apostle is going to set uh, two ideas juxtapose one another. The idea of living in the flesh versus the idea of living in the spirit. And we come to chapter 6 and he reminds us, at least I see here, a, a triad of precepts or a triad of responsibilities that we have as individuals who have been redeemed. And I, I pray this day that you've been redeemed. I, I think about our students often. And I'm going to be honest with you, there are some students who have come through the doors of this institution that I'm not sure about their salvation. Now, I don't have to be. They have to be, and the Lord has to be. But I've often thought that the greatest tragedy, the greatest tragedy that I may have an opportunity to experience is seeing a student that would come through the doors of Clear Creek Baptist Bible College and leave this place not redeemed, leave this place lost and undone in their sin. So notice that the apostle is writing to those who are believers. He says to us in verse number one, he says, brethren, you see how he starts there? He makes it clear that he's talking to those who are in the church, those who uh, have been gathered together, the, uh, the ecclesia, if you will, those who've been called out and they're going somewhere. These are the brothers and sisters that make up the body of Christ. And if we have been redeemed, we have some responsibilities and responsibility always brings with it accountability and we'll see that in a moment. But Paul is clearly speaking to those who have been saved. And he's going to say to us, even if anyone is caught in any trespass. So notice here with me, number one, we find that there is, for the redeemed, there is a responsibility in the realm of restoration. There's a responsibility in the realm of restoration. The first day that I had lunch with our new students, one of the students asked me about my philosophy of leadership. I often phrase my philosophy of leadership this way. Uh, my view is loving people where they are, but leading them to where they need to go. Loving them where they are, but leading them where they need to go. Not, not loving them where they are and leaving them where they are, but loving them where they are and leading them to where they need to be. And, and uh, someone at the table said, can you give a passage of scripture for that? Sure, it's Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And I, I thought, how interesting that uh, the first chapel that I preach is going to come from that particular passage of scripture. But we have a responsibility as the those who have been redeemed to be about the work of reconciliation, to be about the work of restoration. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us in his letter to the church at Corinth that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Do you remember that? Well, here we find that, that Paul's going to take us down another path. He's going to take us down a path that often makes us uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but uh, I am grieved over sin. Sin in my life, sin in your life, sin in the lives of those that, that I know sin should grieve us. Former President Calvin Coolidge, he was known as a man of few words. One particular Sunday, Mrs. Coolidge did not go to church with him. When uh, President Coolidge came back, the story goes that Mrs. Coolidge said, what did he preach about today? To which President Coolidge replied, sin. She said, well, what specifically did he say about sin? To which Coolidge replies, he's against it. Are we really against sin? Are we in a day that we are against sin? I'm afraid that maybe we're like what Billy Sunday said. He said that we treat it as a cream puff instead of a serpent. Maybe you've read the story of the, the former, and I say former because you couldn't do this, I guess, in this day and time, but maybe you've read the story of the former football coach that came out of the state of Texas, Dr. Mitchell, and when he was having a meeting with his players, the first meeting of the year, he had arranged for some rattlesnake wranglers to bust into the meeting room. And there were three men that had three rattlesnakes in a bag. And they threw those snakes down the long table where the team was meeting. And the story goes that those players almost tore the room apart trying to get out of there. Now the wranglers gathered the snakes up. 
the coach set the team back down and he reminded them. He said, young men, over the course of your time here, there's going to be times that you enter a room where drugs are there. And he began to name drugs. He, he began to, to tell them, you're going to have times that you are tempted to cut a corner here or cut a corner there. And he said, I am challenging you that when those moments come that you run from them with the same tenacity that you run from those snakes. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, caught, the word there, prolabano, it, it literally means to be caught up or to be overtaken. This is an interesting word because uh, some translations translate this as being overtaken. But it literally means to be caught up in something, to be tied up in it, or here this thing is that has overtaken you. Let me ask you something, believer. Have you ever come to the place that some sin has overtaken you? I mean, at first you thought you could handle it. You thought, well, you know, I know that other people can't handle this. I know that there's some folks who fall to this, but I believe I can handle it. And then before you know it, this thing has overtaken you. So the apostle is talking to us about a believer who is caught up, who has, who had literally here, who has been tied up as a result of their sin. Proverbs 5.22 said it this way, His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. Sin ties us up. Sin binds us. And sin renders us to a place where we are useless in the kingdom and the economy of God. But I am thankful that there is a bomb in Gilead. I am thankful that there is an answer and it is the Rose of Sharon. You see, Herschel Hobbes wrote this. This was from the 60s. Here's what Hobbes wrote about sin. He said, some people deny the reality of sin, but to do so is to deceive themselves and to make a liar of God. Others laugh at sin, but the Bible says that fools make a mock of sin. Still others take pride in their sin. However, the most dangerous attitude towards sin is to tone down its awfulness. Psychology calls sin maladjustment. Biology labels it a disease. Ethics suggests that it is a moral lapse. Philosophy regards it as a stumbling in the upward progress of the human race. But Hobbes went on to say, but the Bible says that sin is sin and that the wages of sin is death. I don't know about you, but I don't want to see anyone else fall to the wily ways of our enemy. I don't want to see anyone else stumble under the weight of sin. You see, this individual, the Bible says in verse 1, they've come to this place of trespass. The ESV translates it as a transgression. Literally, we find that this word means to stumble or fall and often beyond the boundary. That's why you see trespassing signs. If you're a hunter like me, the property always looks better on the other side of the fence, right? I'm thinking, boy, if I could just get on that property. I know that there's 47 no trespassing signs, but if I could just get across that fence. Oh, so many times I've been tempted to put my stand right up on the fence line. And in those moments, knowing that if I did that, when the game came on the other side of the fence, I probably would be overtaken in my sin. But this individual, the Bible says he's been overtaken. He's caught up in it and he's, he's stumbled or she's stumbled and they've fallen beyond the boundary. But notice the responsibility. The Bible says to us here in verse number one, you who are spiritual... You who are spiritual. The Bible says that the redeemed has a responsibility. Here's the truth of the Christian life. The truth of the Christian life is that we need each other. I know that we're living in a day that we have, you know, or you have your millions of Facebook friends, right? But while we're interconnected like never before, I'm persuaded that we are disconnected like never before. And friend, God has not called you to be the Lone Ranger, we need each other and we have a responsibility to help in the restoration of each other when one gets caught up in these type of things. You see, the reality is uh, in the Christian life, the, the weaker is aided by the stronger. And the strong brother today may be the weak brother tomorrow. Does that make sense? 
We need each other. But he says this, those who are spiritual. Now, what's he mean by spiritual? Well, this word here literally means the antithesis of being carnal or being fleshly. So whatever it means to be worldly, whatever it means to be ungodly, spiritual is on the other essence of that. See, the Apostle Paul's talked about this in chapter 5. In chapter 5, he set the, the ways of the fleshly, and he's set that against the fruits of the Spirit. And just to remind you of a few verses there, in verse 16, he said, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We find in verse 25, he said, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. You see, it's the Spirit that's brought life unto us, the Spirit of the living God. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might know or experience the imputed righteousness of a holy God. And we must walk in that. But notice he talks about this responsibility. The, the, one, the only one who can do it are those who are spiritual. So my challenge, first of all this morning, are you in a place spiritually where you can help a brother or sister who's overtaken in sin? Are you in a place where you can help bring them back to a place of restoration? Some of you know, but uh, for five years I served as dean of students of this institution. And in that role, I, I dealt with all discipline. When Dr. Fox first sent me a job description and that was on there, I, I've told him many times, I really never thought I'd deal with discipline. I mean, I, I thought, you know, what, what kind of discipline do you do on a Bible college campus? That'd be easy. Then I get here and I realize that's most of my job. And I remember the day I sat down in front of him and, and uh, was bemoaning that and he, he literally laughed at me. <laughs> yeah. Because even folks in Bible college end up in situations that they ought not be. But I determined early on, and I determined this even before I ever came on staff of this campus, I determined this as a believer and as a pastor that the end goal of all discipline should be restoration. And God's called us to restore. The word here, restore, called artizo, it, it, it's an interesting word. It's used in the New Testament of the disciples mending their nets. So something is broken, and then it's, it's going to be put back together. But this term was also used in secular Greek. And in secular Greek of the first century, it was used as a medical term. It was a term that was used for the setting of a broken bone. Now, I don't know if you've ever had anything broken or not. But if you've had something broken and it requires a setting, that is not a pleasant experience. I can tell you from experience, it's not pleasant. Now, notice that he says you, you do this with gentleness. Do you see that? You remember that gentleness is one of the nine fruits of the Spirit that he's given us in chapter 5. Some translations translate this as meekness. The word meekness, the best definition I can give you is it's power under control. So this gentleness, you don't want someone to touch you when your bone is broke, but they say this is going to hurt. It's going to hurt now, but it's going to help you down the long run, right? Isn't it so hard to trade the moment for, for what's next? At least I think it is for me. I don't know about you. But in those moments, we need someone who can set the bone back or can mend the net. It requires a few things. One, it requires that they're capable, that they have the knowledge to do that. I don't want just anyone setting the bone. Do you? I want someone who knows what they're doing. And I want someone who has a spirit of gentleness. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but a number of years ago, I was stabbed. I was stabbed cleaning squirrels when, with a friend of mine, and he went to fall. He stumbled and went to fall, went to catch himself on me. The problem is he had a knife in his hand. Now, they rush you to the emergency room, and uh, take me back there, and they're going to sew me up. And I remember this, this young, you know, I was already jealous. He was tall, dark-headed, handsome. He's a doctor. And, and he looks at me, he says, we're going to sew this up. And this is what he said. He said, he said this isn't going to hurt. Now, I'd had stitches. I've had more than my share of stitches. And I'm like, oh, really? I said, have you ever had stitches? And he said, no. But I've given a lot, or I've, I've put a lot in. I said, listen, brother, no offense to you, but putting them in is not the same thing as getting them. This is going to hurt. You don't have to lie to me. 
I understand that. It's going to hurt, but I needed the wound to be sewn up because I had been stabbed and I was bleeding profusely and I, I needed that. I had to be sewn up. He had the skill, but he hadn't experienced it. Most of us, and might I say this, all of us who are believers, we have experienced what it means to be broken down by our sin. We've experienced what it means to be lost. We've experienced what it means to be separated from God. Maybe we, uh, even after salvation, while the sonship has remained, the fellowship has been broken. We know what that means. I want a person like that. Matter of fact, one of the great English preachers, said one time that if he fell in sin, he hoped that he fell in the arms of a barkeep and not in the arms of his church people. He said, because their sharp wagging tongues would assuredly cut me to shreds before I could ever be put back together. Now, I, I don't mention his name because I, I, I kind of think that maybe he wrote that in a time in his life that he was hurting. And I, I want to believe that not everything that he said there is true, but I'm afraid there's probably a twinge of truth there that we don't want to deal with. But notice here, our responsibility is restore the one that has fallen. But then he, he moves on and he reminds us of another, of another aspect here. He says, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted Looking, scapeo there, it means to, to watch intently. It can be used of a lookout that's been set up on a wall. And I want you to understand that not only do we have a responsibility to look out for our brother and our sister in Christ, but all understand that the first place that we must set up guard is on the wall around our own heart. We're watchmen of souls. We're watchmen of our own soul as well. We, we need to watch Ourself. There's a great sermon entitled Watch Your Step, Preacher. He tells us as we move forward in this second verse, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Caleb, come here just a second. I'm a poor preacher and I need some help. Now, Caleb, I know you don't want to do this, okay? But can you, would you mind just to flex your muscles for the, these folks? I mean, just, just a little bit. Would, would, would you do that? I mean, look at, come on up here. Look, look at this guy. I mean, my goodness. Just, I mean, just show them that you're strong, Caleb. Sure. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I'm sure, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure enough. Okay. <laughs> I was going to do that, but I didn't want to come across really egotistical, you know. <laughs> Th thank you, Caleb. A few months ago, I wanted to show that so I can share this. A few months ago, several students helped me move. And one of the items we had was, was my, my largest gun safe. It was empty, and it, it's heavy. I mean, it, it's very, very heavy. And, you know, we had several folks there, and Dr. DeLand was there. He wasn't helping much, but he was there. Um, <laughs> Where's he at? There. So, you'll remember this. By the providence of God, we had put the mattress in first. Okay, so there's a big mattress at the end of the truck. And we're trying to get this safe. It's like 750 pounds up the ramp. Caleb has it on the dolly. Everybody else is pushing. Well, we get it up the ramp, and now it's in the truck. And the truck is angled downhill a little bit. And it becomes obvious Caleb's the only one in the truck. And the further, the faster. Are you tracking with me here? And I'm having flash, flashbacks of an accident I had a few years ago. And, and literally, I, I think me and if my mind's right, Andrew Tucker, we, we leap up into the truck. Now, you can tell I'm not a good leaper. But in this moment, I leap up in the back of this truck and Andrew Tucker with me. And we were able to get that and stop that safe before it crushes Caleb between the safe and the mattress. Caleb's strong, but he's not that strong. You may be strong, but you're not, you're not that strong. You see, the, the Bible says to us here that we have a responsibility to bear one another's burdens. There, there's some things that requires team lifting. Now, I'm going to point this out. The word there for burdens, or some translations translate it that we bear one another's load. The word there refers to something heavy that's going to be carried a long distance. 
Something heavy that's going to be carried a long distance. It's beyond what one man can do by himself. Maybe you've seen the box and on the side it's labeled team lifting. Well, understand, folks, that there's some things that requires a team to lift it. We, we need more than one. And he reminds us here that we bear one another's burdens. We need each other in this earthly journey. Martin Luther said that Christians must have broad shoulders and husky bones in order to carry the burdens of his brothers and sisters. But notice what he says next. It, this is intriguing to me, and I'll, I'll spend more time here than I need to if I'm not careful, so I'm going to touch it and move on. But notice what the verse says next. It says, when we do this, we fulfill the law of Christ. We fulfill the law of Christ. Now, what is the law of Christ? It's interesting, this phrase is not, not used in this exact form anywhere else in the New Testament. Now, Dr. Lucas has his Greek New Testament. He's about to double-check me. But in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 21, we see that phrase there, but it's not the same Greek word for, for law. It's a different word. The, it's a different form of the word. This is the only place that we find this word. What in the world is the law of Christ? Well, maybe he's referring to what he's just said in verse 14 of chapter 5. He says in verse 14 of chapter 5, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, which takes us back to when Jesus has the encounter in Mark chapter 12, and he's asked, What is the greatest commandment? His response here, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. You see, they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? This had been a debate uh, in rabbinical circles. We, we read and, and history tells us for some time. But Jesus says, that's such an easy question. I'll tell you not only what the first one is, I'll tell you what the second most important is as well. I'll tell you, give you one and two. We love our neighbor as ourself. What does it mean to fulfill the law of Christ? Well, I'm persuaded that it's, it's tied to the law of love. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We find that Jesus came born miraculously of the virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died a vicarious death. He arose from the grave victoriously. He ascended into heaven visibly. He sat down at the right hand of the Father authoritatively. And friend, he's coming again imminently. We find the truth of the gospel. Amen. What is the gospel? Boy, we need to learn that again in, in our day. You see, it's not about gospel watches and gospel wallets and gospel ties. Jesus is the gospel. And the law of Christ, it's a law of redemption. He's a redeeming God. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And you and I should be about the restoration of one another. And you and I should be about the preservation of, of even our own self. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't believe that it is the preservation of the saints. I believe it's the preservation of the Savior. You didn't save yourself, and you're not going to keep yourself saved. But the Apostle Paul makes it clear in, uh, in his writing. Uh, the Apostle Peter makes it clear in 1 Peter uh, and 2 Peter that our faith is uh, that we guard our own faith as well. We have responsibility there. But I, I think maybe the law of Christ is tied to the truth and the power of the gospel. But look with me secondly. Not only do we see that the redeemed have a responsibility in the realm of restoration, we have a responsibility in the realm of evaluation. Look what he says in verse 3. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Do you know the easiest person to deceive is ourselves? It's easy to deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves all the time. We deceive ourselves in a myriad of ways. And one of the most dangerous ways that we do that is based upon our spiritual standing, based upon our relationship with holy God. And I'm not just talking about your relationship with the local body of Christ. I'm talking about your relationship with the, the bridegroom. How's our relationship with him Notice what the Bible says to us in this fourth verse, but each one must examine his own work. The word here, examine, dokamazo, my pronunciation is a little off there, but I'll just keep moving. 
BDAG defines it as this, as critically examining something to determine its genuineness. Dokimazo, there you go, that's a little bit better. As critically examining something to determine its genuineness. It's, is it genuine? Is, are there validity in these elements? And he, he tells us we have responsibility that we examine ourselves. I don't know about you, but I would much rather examine you than examine me. Isn't that easier? I've said this many times. It's very easy for me to tell you what you ought to do and hard to apply that in my own life. I don't know. Most of you are that way too. It's easy to point our finger. I'll give you an example. Go read the first five chapters of Isaiah. Isaiah's, woe to you, woe to you, woe to them, woe to them over there. And then you get to chapter 5. He has an encounter with holy God. And do you know what Isaiah says? He doesn't say, woe to you. He doesn't say, woe to you over there. He says, woe is me. We're no longer broken over sin. We live in such a, such a desensitized culture that sin doesn't bother us. We carry talk we shouldn't talk. We walk in places we shouldn't walk. There's too much sex and violence on most of our DVRs. Can I get a witness there? Hmm? I can look back over the course of my time here and think about some debates I've had with students in the classroom, and I don't want to go down that road, but I remember one that debated me vehemently. The foul language wasn't wrong for a believer. I got news for you. Foul language is, long, is wrong for anyone. It should be culturally wrong, but it's absolutely scripturally wrong because no profane thing should come through our mouth. My daughter reminded me earlier this summer of a passage of scripture, and you guys know it well, but the, the Bible tells us it's not what goes in a man's mouth that defiles him, but it's what comes out. You see, we have to examine ourselves to make sure there's genuineness there. The Apostle Paul echoed this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight 28 when he said, but let a man examine himself. And I've got to hurry. Man, that clock back there is hard to miss. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 and 5 says this, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take this speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We have a responsibility as redeemed folks to be involved in the restoration of brothers and sisters who stumble and fall or who are overtaken by sin. But if we're not the watchman on the wall around our own heart, guarding our own self, making sure that we are prepared and we're going to end up in a mess. I won't mention the names because it doesn't matter, uh, doesn't matter in our day. You mention anything political, whether it's meant politically or not, someone's upset. You can look back through history. In the, the not too distant past, we had a president who was called up in adultery. And he, he secured a spiritual advisor to counsel him and mentor him through that incident. What come out a few months later is the spiritual advisor, the reverend that he had brought to walk him through it. He was also involved in an affair in the same time that he's given counsel to his brother. The Bible says if the blind follow the blind, they both, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. We have to make sure where we are. Guard your heart, guard your life. And as you go through your time here as a student, you're going to be mad. There'll be times you'll be mad at me. You're mad at your professor. You're, you're mad at the, uh, the person mowing the yard. You're mad at, at the one uh, dipping mashed potatoes on your plate. You're, you're mad at, at the one who, who fixes the water. You're mad at the one who buys the cleaning supplies. And that's just the nature of it. But you're also at times going to be mad at each other. And when that happens, would you please just stop? Would you stop for just a moment and take a spiritual evaluation and determine, is your anger well placed? Is your anger a result of not being a very good watchman on the wall of your own heart? And when you see your brothers and sisters and your friends and your family in those situations, would you be one that would, would hold the, the line to pull them back in to the family of God? Well, thirdly and lastly, by my count, I don't know who sets this up, by my count, I've got 10 minutes, so... No, number three, and then I'm done, a responsibility in the realm of declaration and presentation. Now, we see there's a responsibility in the realm of restoration. 
there's a responsibility in the realm of examination. And then thirdly and finally, there's responsibility in the, the realm or the realms of, of declaration and presentation. Now, you say, why declaration? Well, because we need to declare ourselves for service. If we're a believer and we've been born again, God hasn't saved you to sit. He saved you to serve. And we need to declare ourselves, reporting for duty, so that we might hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Now, listen to verse 5, final verse. For each one will bear his own load. Now, at first glance, this seems antithetical to verse 2, doesn't it? I mean, how can this be compatible with verse 2? Verse 2 says that we're going to bear one another's load or we'll bear one another's burden. But then we get here to, to verse number 5, and he says we're going to, to bear our own burden. Well, it's two different words. You remember the word used for burden or load in verse number 2 it refers to a load that's too heavy for one to carry or at least too heavy for one to carry any distance. And it implies that that's a, a load that's got to be carried a distance. But it's a much different word that's used in verse number 5. As a matter of fact, in verse number 5, that word in secular Greek was most commonly used to denote a, a backpack or a knapsack of a soldier or of a pilgrim. And might I remind you that we're a soldier in the army of the Lord and we're a pilgrim passing through because this world is not our home. But John Stott taught that this verse had eschatological implications. That's interesting if you're a New Testament guy because most New Testament scholars say that Galatians is one of the only uh, Pauline epistles that is void of eschatological language. But John Stott said that this, this verse lends itself to an eschatological usage. Literally, here's how Stott taught it. Stott taught it that that verse us bearing our own load refers to the day that we must appear at the Bema seat of Christ. And he, he says there that no one can go for you. In essence, Stott would say, we can help you carry your load down here, but there's coming a day that we're going before the judgment seat and we must carry our own load. So let's take that, that imagery. Now that word used for load or burden there, most commonly is a backpack, right? This is the backpack of my, my life. This is a one-man backpack, right? We, we can't carry it together if it's on my shoulders like this. And the backpack of my life has been put on. There's things back there I'm proud of. There's things back there I'm not proud of. There's things back there that I would gleefully be able to go back and relive them exactly as they happened. And there's things in there that I would gleefully go back and I would do so many things different. But understand this, there, there's coming a day when the breath leaves my body and the light of life is no longer in my eyes. And when that day comes, that's the start of, of me coming to this place that we understand the Bema seat. You see, we all must appear. The apostle said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I was talking to someone here recently. They were trying to make a decision. And they said, well, you know, but if I do this and it works out bad, it's not my fault. But if I do this and it works out bad, then it's my fault. I made this statement. I said, it's a terrible way to live life. It's a terrible way. Let me tell you why that's a terrible way. Because there's coming a day we're going to give an account. We're going to give an account before a holy, righteous God. Now, you, you hear me clearly. I'm thankful I'll never give an account to any of you. I'm not being mean. But some, of, some of you are like me at times. You're censorious. You're judgmental. You, you look for the faults and flaws in everything. It, it, it's human nature. And I will remind you what the apostle said about this evaluation. Do you remember? He tells us in verse number 4, but each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. I mean, I'm not a very good basketball player compared to Michael Jordan or LeBron James, but I bet you I'm better than the preschool team down at Bell Central. Don't you? 
And isn't it amazing those that we or what in what ways we compare ourselves? Don't settle for average. Let me tell you what average is. Average is the best of the worst and the worst of the best. Don't settle for it. The enemy is going to try to convince you, well, you're just average. You're just going to be like an average Christian doing average things in average ways. William Carey said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. We're carrying our backpack, uh, our, our life, and no one else can carry this for me. I, we can help each other carry the burdens, earthly speaking, that's too big for us. But there's coming a day that we'll carry our own load, the Bema Seat of Christ, and we'll come before the righteous judge, the one who knows all things, and he will judge righteously. Our works will be tried, whether they, they prove out to be uh, gold, silver, or precious stone, or whether they be wood, hay, and stubble. The responsibility of the redeemed. I pray today that you'll live up to your responsibility. I pray today that you'll take your responsibility serious, knowing that we're going to give an account, not to each other, but to one who knows all things. And I, I long to hear, and I want you to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Fathers, we come before you this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the privilege and opportunity to preach it. And Lord, I ask you, I ask you that I might fulfill the responsibility of the redeemed as we see in these first few verses of Galatians chapter 6. Lord, I pray that I'd be one who's eager to restore a brother or sister that's fallen, that's stumbled, that's crossed the boundary, been overtaken by sin. And Father, I, I pray that I would be careful to watch my own life. Lord, I, I pray that, that I, I would be one that walks with you. Lord, not before you, but with you. Lord, not behind you, but with you. And Father, I pray that, that I might be in step with you so that I might also lead others to become in step with you. And Lord God, I, I pray that my evaluation of myself would be honest. It'd be real. And Lord, that, that when I find myself short of the mark which you have set, Lord, I'd repent, seek restoration that only you can give. And Father, I pray that those around me would be quick to restore and to, to love and to help. And Father, ultimately, I, I pray that when the day comes, when the day comes and I stand before you at the beam of seat, Lord, I, I pray that you're, you're pleased with my life. Lord, I pray that my life and my decisions, my actions and my words, Lord, that they'll be determined to be honoring of you. And Lord, I, I'm a man with feet of clay. I understand that that can't be said for everything that I carry in the backpack of my life. But Lord, I thank you that where sin did abound, that grace did much more abound. Thank you, God of grace. It's in your precious and holy name, the name of our Savior, we pray these things. Amen and amen.